Hello and welcome. Between 1952 and 1963, the British government, with the agreement and support of the Australian government, carried out nuclear tests at three sites in Australia, at Montebello Islands, off the West Australian coast, and at Emu Field and Maralinga in South Australia. In response to growing concerns about the lack of safety standards observed during the conduct of the nuclear trials, especially with regard to measures taken to protect people from the exposure to ionising radiation and the disposal of radioactive substances and toxic materials, the Australian Government established a Royal Commission in 1984 to inquire into these aspects of the tests. The Royal Commission into British nuclear tests in Australia during the 1950s and 1960s gave considerable attention to the tests conducted in the Maralinga area. Many of the records of the Royal Commission are publicly available and may be viewed in the National Archives Canberra Research Centre. In the years after World War II, both Britain and Australia expressed the view that the development of a nuclear deterrent that was independent of the USA was essential to maintain peace as well as being a means of thwarting the imperialist aspirations of Soviet Russia. A British A-bomb could be used as a counterbalance to the USA whose global hegemony in the post-war years was a matter of concern in Whitehall. In these precarious balancing games, Australia, under Prime Minister Menzies, became a willing pawn. Implicit in the development of a British nuclear deterrent was both Britain's desire to demonstrate its status as a world power and its ability to test the bomb at a suitable site. When discussions on British testing in the USA broke down in 1950, Prime Minister Attlee accepted a suggestion that Australia could provide a suitable test site. The Minister for Supply, Mr Howard Beale, said in 1955, England has the know-how. We have the open spaces much technical skill and a great willingness to help the motherland to build the defences of the free world and make historic advances in harnessing the forces of nature. The open spaces were to be the Australian offshore islands in the Indian Ocean called Monte Pelo and later the mainland test sites at Emu Fields and Maralinga in the Great Victoria Desert. At the time, it was understood that Aborigines had lived in these mainland areas and that it was possible, though perhaps unlikely, that some Aborigines might still be living there. Indeed, the patrol officer attached to Woomera, the rocket testing facility some 500 kilometres east southeast of the atomic bomb test site, was required to determine the numbers of Aborigines in the desert regions, which later became the test sites. One man was scarcely able to give an accurate account of the Aboriginal population over 100,000 square kilometres. Really? Even with the appointment in 1956 of an additional patrol officer, it was evident to them that there were Aborigines living in the prohibited area during testing. It was also clear that at least one family of Aborigines traversed and camped in the test area incurring considerable contamination and that others suffering hardship and perhaps death as a result of being told to evacuate their lands. Well, I didn't know was a um, big community. Used to be in 40s, late 40s and early 50s. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, the bang seven, was one big one but it sounded like other little um, banks in between and uh, the ground shook. Then uh, mid-morning we seen uh, the um, radiation full out, what we're calling it, black, black smoke. Others may have experienced sickness and perhaps blindness as a result of contact with contaminated clouds following one of the tests. While efforts at controlling Aboriginal movements were well-intentioned from a health and safety perspective, 
the development of the British nuclear deterrent and Australia's role in it had two fundamental consequences for Aborigines. They were cut off from their lands, being unable to revisit their country as they had done when they lived at Oldea. Out over Walladinna from Tadum One. And uh, that's all we proved. Everything else we just couldn't. A triumph for British scientists and the Australian technicians who made possible the test at Maralinga. I was in the Air Force, I had no option. You do as you're told in those days or else you got uh, dealt with. Equally significant was their awareness that their land and its sacred sites and waterholes were being devastated by enormous explosions. The emotional and psychological stress that this certainly engendered has never been and can probably never be properly evaluated. One elderly man stated, At Yalata, we were still thinking about country, but they put a block on you, like a paddock, shut. There were soldiers at Watson Railway Station and piling rock hole where the water was no good. Waluna rock hole, can't, we can't trust in water near Maralinga. Another woman stated, when we were sitting at Yalata, we didn't want to come to our country. The patrol officer McDougall said, you have to sit down leave your country altogether and be mindful. McDougall told us, you are not to go back because dangerous. The old men were feeling no good. He was crying for his country. The bomb finished it. Britain went on to test 12 atmospheric nuclear bombs at Maralinga, but the worst contamination came from a series of minor trials with nuclear warheads in the early 1960s. Nearly 700 trials of air and land missile strikes were tested over the decade. They released an estimated 100 kilogram of radioactive and toxic elements. I think that's open to interpretation. 70 years after British bomb tests in the Montebello Islands, visitors are warned to limit a visit to just one hour a day due to lingering radiation. Right. At the Maralinga test site, 330,000 cubic metres of topsoil and structures were bulldozed into 21 debris pits. An estimated 3.3 kilo of plutonium was contained in that soil. It is the ingestion of plutonium, such as by inhalation of dust, that is considered lethal. The area is now being opened up to tourism. The insanity is that distributing radioactive material into the atmosphere exposes everyone on Earth. There have been over 2,000 nuclear tests since the 6th of August 1945 when the first atomic bomb was exploded over Japan. Radioactive material from these bombs doesn't disappear. Upper winds distribute it worldwide. For example, plutonium-239 which has a half-life of 24,065 years, is now part of our environment. Living cells of plants and animals on land, air and in the sea incorporate the molecules with, radi with radiation acting on DNA and genetic material. Thank you for watching. Please comment, like and subscribe to promote content.